Recall yesterday, we said that militant Islam would be in the news this morning. We say that because it's in the news every morning. Tragically, it was in the news because of the ambush of a number of policemen here in the Philippines this morning. Every morning. Tomorrow morning, there will be something yet again about, about all this. Well, we were uh, looking yesterday and uh, our notes and we had just talked about how in theory the Muslims believe in four books, how, uh, how in their practice they, they use the one book. And we're right ready to read that note that says the Quran right underneath that. We see the page that has the Quran and then the next paragraph is number four, the prophets and so forth. Well, because of the supposed corruption of the scriptural books, Allah gave Muhammad the Quran. Many Muslims try to find Muhammad in the Bible. I believe he's referred to in Deuteronomy 18.16, which we looked at yesterday. But also John 14.16. John 14.16 says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. And Muslims teach that comforter is Muhammad. And we know that comforter is the Holy Spirit. That is again a place where they try to find Muhammad in the book. Islam teaches this is a promise of the coming of Muhammad. He is the prophet and the comfort. Muhammad, though, is certainly not a biblical prophet, nor are his teachings really much of a comfort at all. Well, on prophets, we're going through the doctrine. Islam teaches that God has spoken to numerous prophets down through the centuries, including Adam, Noah, and Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. The greatest prophet and the last prophet is Muhammad. He is the seal of the prophets. Muhammad did, in fact, present himself as the last person that God would give revelation through. There are some offshoots of Islam which claim a prophet after Muhammad. The black Muslim make claims of additional prophets since Muhammad, which is one reason the Islamic leadership will not accept them as a true uh, reform of Islam. There are 72 official versions of Islam which are not recognized by Islamic leaders, and that black Muslims as well or not. Can I borrow somebody's pen for just a moment? There's a typo there. I need to get corrected in the next printing of the book. I had not caught. It should be reform, not perform. Um, the last days will be a time of resurrection and judgment. According to Islam, everyone will be resurrected to stand before Allah to be judged in the last day. Those who follow Allah and Muhammad will go to paradise and others will go to hell. Everyone will pass through hell and even some Muslims will spend time in hell till their sins are burned away and Muhammad intercedes for them. Those whose bad deeds outweigh the good may have to spend time in hell until their sins are purged away, even if they have kept the five pillars of the faith. The emphasis is doing more right than wrong. This doctrine is not far from the doctrine of purgatory. While everyone passes through hell, unbelievers remain there. Some Muslims walk right through hell and go directly to paradise. Hell, according to Islam, hell is a place of Allah's judgment where Muslims will spend time before entering paradise. Unbelievers will have no escape. Muslims believe Muhammad will intercede for them and deliver them from hell. There's been much written about the person who's been in hell for many years with Muhammad portrayed coming into the fires of hell to deliver him. Novels, story, and art have been created depicting that glorious moment when Muhammad comes to hell because someone is about to be delivered. Sadly, when a Muslim dies without Christ, he'll arrive in hell only to discover that Muhammad is there with him and no one is coming for him. Other Islamic doctrines. Jesus. According to Islam, Jesus is just a prophet and not the Son of God. According to Islam, Jesus never died on the cross. He was only a prophet to the Jews who was not crucified but was caught up into heaven. A high-ranking member of Al-Qaeda has said in his hearing that it was not as difficult for Christians to become Muslims. They must only give up the Trinity and give up the cross. Those are the doctrines which are offensive to them. Islam believes that God placed a substitute in Jesus' place on the cross. Many believe it was the belief that it was not Jesus who died on the cross is very important Muslims. So many Muslims feel the substitute was Judas. Other branches believe it was Simon of Cyrene, but what they're in agreement on is that Jesus never died on the cross. 
There is no atonement. There is no blood sacrifice. That somebody else was forced to die in Jesus' place, and Jesus just simply ascended in heaven. They're horrified at this simple idea that Jesus paid for man's sin. Because Islam is based around how to teach you how to pay for your own sin. So the idea that Jesus paid for your sin is horrifying to them. Well, Muslims are, however, expecting Jesus to return. Jesus is the Messiah who's coming at the end. But in that return, it's taught it will kill all the Jews, all the Christians, and also all pigs. He'll break all crosses as the cross is considered to be especially offensive to him. He'll get married, die 40 years later, and be buried in Medina next to Muhammad. The resurrection will immediately follow. So they have a doctrine of Jesus, and, and you'll find some paragraphs in the Quran where nice things are said about Jesus, but don't think for a moment they're referring to the Jesus of the Bible. That's why we said yesterday, you can't go to those paragraphs that say good things about Jesus and use them to try and witness to a Muslim, because they're not talking about the Jesus of the Bible that died for our sins at all. Scripture does, truly does say there will be false Christ. Muhammad was a false Christ, and there will be others at the end. Well, these false Christs appeal to people. It is feasible that one would say to Islam, I am Jesus, come back, and they may believe him. The return of Christ is taught in other religions as well. One Hindu temple in Trinidad is devoted to the return of Jesus Christ. In fact, there's a teacher in India who claims to be the reincarnated Jesus Christ. I, actually, I was in Trinidad, and um, this, this fellow who claims to be Christ's return was actually at the temple in Trinidad that is devoted to the return of Christ. And they're not talking about the Christ of the Bible. And uh, the pastor and I went to that temple to try and meet him. I said, I've met Jesus three times. I thought four would, would be good. And we could see him, but guards with machetes would not let us get close enough to talk to him. And they were very serious about it. But well, we got the point. They, they just stood there sharpening their machetes and blurring at us and standing in our way. We got the idea. According to these Hindus, Christ was the first person to achieve nirvana, pay for all of his sins, and reach the position of not having to return to be reincarnated. But he left Nirvana and came back because he's so offended by the claims of Christianity that salvation is to be found through Jesus, and he came back to convince everyone that salvation was not found through him. This one thing is true, salvation is not to be found through that teaching. Well, salvation. The Muslims believe in salvation by obedience to Allah. Allah will intercede on behalf of Muslims. I mean, Muhammad will intercede on behalf of Muslims for Allah. In a scale, Allah will weigh the sins and good deeds to determine the punishment. They believe you'll actually go before Allah, and there'll be a scale, and on the scale will be things that represent your bad deeds and things that represent your good deeds, and so we'll find out which weighs the most. Your good deeds or your bad deeds. And if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you can go directly to paradise without spending time in hell. But even if you kept the five pillars, if your bad deeds outweigh the good deeds, you have to spend some time in hell paying for your sin. And that time would be dramatically different for different people. The balance determines the debt to be paid. Time in hell will be necessary to pay for sins that outweigh the good deeds, after which Muslims will be accepted in the paradise. Non-believers will go to hell with no hope of escape. In some more modern forms of Islam, there are actually some who hold out some hope that some non-Muslims will get to heaven one day. They teach that not being a Muslim and not doing all the good deeds which Islam prescribes will cause their sins to far outweigh their good deeds, and that the non-Muslim will be in hell for a long time before being released. Some more modern Muslims say that some of you folks might make it after spending enough time in hell to pay for not having been Muslim and all your other things. But most of them teach you directly to hell stay there forever. More traditionally, Islam believes that non-Muslims are doomed to hell forever. Muslims who die in Yihad or Holy War will go directly to paradise where 72 virgins will be waiting them. No matter how much you sin, if you die in a Holy War, you go directly to paradise where there's a harem of 72 women waiting to serve you. And if you pick this up, salvation knows all about men. 
However, there's no explanation what happens to women to the women who live in this world. And, and let me say this, I don't want to be crude at all. The Quran does not say 72 virgins. That, that is something that gets told today in politically correct fashion. The Quran actually describes the 72 women in an entirely different fashion. Yeah. The 72 to very sensual women and, and, and ungodly women and, and all waiting to serve the one man. Uh, virgin is not the word of the Quran. Some people were puzzled over the behavior of the terrorists who flew the plane to the World Trade Center. These devoted Muslims, living their life in holy war, were found during their last few nights drinking, attending script clubs, engaged in immorality. These were all violations of Islam's teaching. Yet Islam also teaches that anyone who dies in holy war, no matter what he's done, will go directly to heaven. So they thought they had a free pass. They were going to die in holy war. They didn't have to pay for any of their sins. So they're living it up. Because they have a free pass to do all these things in their mind. Though uh, they were all, yet Islam also teaches anyone who dies in holy war, no matter what he's done, will directly heaven. These men must have imagined a crash, dying in the fire, and waking up in paradise. Tragically, they died in fire and woke up in fire more different than they imagined. The 72 virgins awaiting the Muslims in paradise act as a harem or serves the sensual interests of these men throughout eternity. Some people have said that Islam is a religion which teaches people to be moral now so they have the opportunity to be immoral forever. It's a bizarre teaching, yet its power should not be underestimated. It's customary for the suicide bomber to make a tape before they go. One teenage boy spoke on such a tape specifically of resisting the lust of the flesh in anticipation of having eternity to indulge himself. People joke and laugh about this. It plays a powerful role in the appeal to martyrdom. Yes. It really does. It makes a significant difference. Right. John Quincy Adams, sixth president of the United States, long time back, said this. Today, intolerance to Islam is seen as a new and recent problem, and Islam is being portrayed as a peaceful world religion. However, that's not the record at all. The sixth president of the United States, John Quincy Adams, summed up the feeling of the Western world of his day, that of the early 1800s concerning Islam. In the seventh century of the Christian era, a wandering Arab of the lineage of Hagar the Egyptian, combining the powers of transcendent genius with the preternatural energy of a fanatic and the fraudulent spirit of an apostate. Okay. Didn't exactly have nice things to say about Muhammad proclaimed himself as a messenger from heaven and spread desolation and delusion over an extensive part of the earth, adopting from the sublime concept of the Mosaic Law, the doctrine of the one omnipotent God, he connected in the solitude with it with the audacious falsehood that he was himself his prophet and apostle, adopting the new revelation of Jesus, the faith and hope of reward life, a future retribution. He humbled it to the dust by adapting all the rewards and sanctions of his religion to the gratification of the sexual passion. He poisoned the source of human felicity at the fountain by degrading the condition of the female sex and the allowance of polygamy. Okay. Again, just a very, very uh, harsh but accurate condemnation of what happened with Muhammad. This is not new. This idea that all of a sudden in this day and age some evil people have, have developed a phobia about Islam and accused them of violence is not at all true. It's been violent from the beginning. And people do that. This polygamy is, is to be found in a very convenient revelation. Normal Islamic tradition permits four wives. In the energy of his youth, a man will often marry three women who remain with him throughout his life. Then in his midlife, he may marry a fourth wife, often in her teen years or early 20s. So when you're in your teen, your early 20s, you marry three wives, roughly your own age. 30 years later, in what in the Western world is called a midlife crisis, you marry a new wife, usually a teenager in your 20s. Very convenient revelation. While his three wives have been together for decades and are roughly the same age and have the same circumstances, 
This new wife typically warrants the husband's greatest attention. This can generate substantial hostility among the other wives. This is a current practice derived from supposed revelation of polygamy. While in Suriname on my very first missionary trip, we had a young lady saved in service who was a fourth wife. She had just married a Muslim husband and, and was being treated very badly by the other three wives because she was getting all the attention. And the other three wives would not let her go to mosque with them. Somehow, in the grace of God, she wandered in, into a Bible-believing Baptist church Amen. and at a time of real heartache, heard the gospel and trusted Christ as her Savior. Amen. But she explained to us what she was going through. Well, this is a current practice derived from the supposed revelation of polygamy. And he declared a distinguishing and exterminating war as part of his religion against all the rest of mankind. See what John Quincy Adams said about him in the early 1800s and about Islam? Described it as ex undistinguishing and exterminating war against all the rest of mankind. This has clearly been the historical record and is not new. The essence of his doctrine was violence and lust to exalt the brutal or the spiritual part of human nature. Between these two religions, thus contrasting their character, a war of 1,200 years has already raged. The war is yet flagrant, while the merciless and dissolute dogmas of the false prophet shall furnish motives to human action. There can never be peace on earth and goodwill towards men. But John Quincy Adams understood in the early 1800s Islam was at war with all the rest of the world. It was obvious. It's just as obvious today. Except in John Quincy Adams' day, there was no such thing as multiculturalism, the belief that all religions are the same and all religions are good. That would have been considered foolish. For 50 years in the West, we've been telling ourselves, all religions are the same, all religions are good, all religions are peaceful. And we have told ourselves that so much in the United States, we cannot bring ourselves to face the facts that are all around us. That makes it much more difficult to win the war on terror when you pretend it doesn't exist. Can you imagine the United States going to war okay, with Japan in World War II and pretending that the nation of Japan was not at war with us, just a few little individual Japanese? But we're living in a day, and uh, writing about this in the 60s, a man named Jim, James Burnham wrote a book entitled The Suicide of the West. We've so convinced ourselves that certain things were true that weren't true that we're in a help, almost helpless position. And, and you see that over and over and over again in front of us. Well, moving on. Again, these come out of our world history books. Next chapter, Islamic Conquest. Paul Johnson, a historian, is quoting Theodore Roosevelt in a biography called Theodore Roosevelt, American Monarch, another American president. Prayer is our greatest weapon in these or any other times. Best we not send our boys across the sea to face the heathen hordes, lest we have a nation at home one in prayer. If history teaches us nothing else, let us at least remember what the Byzantines learned, what the Crusaders learned, what the French learned. You cannot face the dread terror of Islam in mere human strength. When the quietude of the desert has been stirred, let all Christian men and women turn to the sovereign Lord. Let all Christian men and women turn to Him in holy seasons of prayer. Now, don't have anything like that in any American presidents today. Theodore Roosevelt said, We should not even be sending our men across the sea to fight Islam. And, and he's talking about the Ottoman Empire, which was our enemy in World War I. He said, we shouldn't even send our troops over there without getting right with God first. And he said, the Byzantine Empire, the Crusaders, and the French all found out the hard way. You can't defeat Islam with military weapons. The American president saying that today. But, but lived in a different age. Again, they had not been blinded by 50 years of multiculturalism. Then. This statement by Theodore Roosevelt made in reference to fighting the Ottoman Empire in World War I. 
This remains tremendous advice as the United States finds itself in exactly the same situation today. When you send soldiers to fight a foe which is committed to a false religion, it's necessary to bathe them in prayer. Military means are not enough. This is a spiritual battle. Right? Though some victories are being won in the war on terror, the cause is hindered because it's being dealt with as a military issue rather than a spiritual one. America is refusing to face what is at war with us and certainly refusing to allow it to create a spiritual renewal. Robert Spencer, the politically correct and guide to Islam, the Quran is unique among the sacred writings of the world in counseling its adherents to make war against unbelievers. None of the Hindu books, none of the Buddhist books, none of the Confucius books says conquer the world by force. So as bad a theology as they are, they are not political movements, and they're not a political threat. As we were asked in the question and answer time yesterday, was Islam a political movement or a religion? And the answer is yes. And again, you see that. Our own United States uh, National Security Advisor made the statement that the Muslim Brotherhood was not a religious organization, and that only bigots would accuse it of being a religious organization. But they don't know they're not a religious organization. That's why they call themselves the Muslim Brotherhood. To them, it is all one. And, and, and we have the absurd scene of the fellow who's supposed to be in charge of America's security saying the Muslim Brotherhood was not religious. It, it's absurd on the face of it. Of course the Muslim Brotherhood is religious. It's Muslim. Right. That's the situation we find ourselves in. Well, those, those, uh, we drop down in respect to it. The scripture does not require that anyone be made Christian by force. Buddhism does not teach that force should be used to convert anyone to their beliefs, neither does Hinduism. Islam stands alone. While Buddhism and Hinduism teach a theology which is just as false as Islam, they do not require the attention of political and military leaders because they have no program for conquering the world by force. In other words, we don't have to deal in the Philippines or in the United States. We, our military doesn't need to know the details of Buddhism or the details of Hinduism because they are not a military force against us. Uh -huh. They do need to know the details of Islam because it is a military force against us. Islam does have such a program and does not progress by persuading people to follow Islam. Their conquests have never been achieved that way. Consider these quotes. The first was delivered by Muhammad shortly before he died, March 632. I was ordered to fight all men until they say, there is no God but Allah. Because that's what God told him to do. Fight everyone until they say that. January 1189. Emperor Saladin. I shall cross this sea to their islands, talking about England, to pursue them until there remains no one on the face of the earth who does not acknowledge Allah. 1979, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Emperor Sal, a major figure in the Arab Crusades, was not able to carry out his goal to attack Europe and force the people to claim Allah. 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini, we will export our revolution throughout the world until they say there is no God but Allah and his prophet Muhammad. 2001, Osama bin Laden. I was ordered to fight the people until they say there is no God but Allah and his prophet Muhammad. Uh, what's changed from 632 to 2001? It's exactly the same ideology. We will use force to make the world Islam. Okay? Not every Muslim believes that. Not every Muslim is a, a fundamental Muslim. There are modernist Muslims who have tailored the religion to their own setting. But there are millions, tens of millions of Muslims who believe it is their sacred duty to conquer the world by force and to kill everyone who will not acknowledge Islam. You can't hide from that. Okay. We're discussing that in contemporary theology, what sounds like a political issue, but we're discussing it in contemporary theology because that's the issue we find ourselves in in the Western world, at 
at least in my country, that we will not face. There's a religious dimension to this. Right. But like it or not, there is. These are not people corrupting Islam. These are the people taking the Quran liberally. Mm -hmm. The politically correct position of the United States today is to say such people as Bin Laden and Khomeini hijack one of the world's great peaceful religions, misusing and misconstruing it to bring something new in it. There's no truth to that. Khomeini and Bin Laden came in the spirit of Muhammad, saying what Muhammad said almost to the very word. The United States is in danger because it has become too ignorant of history to understand what has been the historical record of Islam. Islam and conquest. Islam is unique among the religions of the world because it is the only one with a specific plan to spread its message through the world by military force. This is clearly illustrated in a recent incident. Gratia and Martin Burnham, missionaries to the Philippines, on a holiday, were kidnapped by militant Islamic extremists in the southern part of the Philippines and held for ransom. The Filipino military made an attempt to rescue them a year later. Gratia was rescued, but tragically, Martin Burnham was killed. Gratia wrote a book about the experience, and she records how she asked the men what they were fighting for. They said the southern part of the Philippines, uh, southern part of the Philippines, Mindanao, belonged to them and should be Muslim. Mindanao today has a Muslim sultan whose family once ruled over it. His palace can be toured, and at one place there is a display depicting a direct line from Muhammad to his family and from his family to him. Gracious captors were saying they were fighting because Mindanao should be Muslim territory. Gracious, Gracia then asked them if the Filipino government gave them Mindanao, would the fighting stop? Her captor replied it would not, that they then must have the island north of that. Gracia asked if granting that island would end the fighting. He again told her no. She asked why and he told her that Allah is for the whole world. There is one goal and one goal only for Islam, that is to bring the entire world under the jurisdiction of Islam. In the history of the last 1400 years, Islam has never been successfully advanced by peaceful means, it's always by conquest. This is the historical record which needs to be understood. The following are a few quotes from the Quran and also from the Adith, which is a recognized commentary on the Quran. Surah 914, kill the infidels and God will torment them and cover them in shame. The infidels are not Muslims. Or Surah 973, Prophet, make war on the infidels and the hypocrites and deal rigorously with them. Hell shall be their home and evil fate. There's a vast difference between the Christian understanding that those who die without trusting Christ will be condemned to hell, this Muslim statement. Christians are not killing people to send them on their way, which makes all the difference in the world. There should be no offense in trying to reach unbelievers out of concern for their eternal destiny. Religion which will try to send them to hell is so offensive. Surah 926. Fight against such as of those to whom the scriptures were given as believed neither in Allah nor the last day. When they refer to people to whom the scriptures were given, who are they talking about? The Jews. Given the Old Testament. They say kill them. And the Jews who don't believe in Allah, kill them. Christianity and Judaism have had the scriptures given to us, but neither believes in Islam's prophecy of the last day, and neither believes in their Allah. This statement clearly is referencing the Christians and Jews. Muhammad is Allah's prophet. Those who follow him are ruthless to the infidels, the merciful one to another. Surah 48, 29. The New Testament says to do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. The Quran says to be ruthless to the infidels, be merciful to one another. Let those who exchange the life of this world for the hereafter fight for the cause of Allah, whether they die or conquer, we shall richly reward them. Or how, how about this, the Hadith, which is the official commentary? Is this clear enough? Wherever you find the infidels, kill them. Whoever kills them shall have reward on the day of resurrection. This statement gives license to kill non-Muslims wherever and whenever the opportunity allows. And, and here I mentioned my, my trip to Syria, and let me say a little bit more about it in detail. I went to Syria in 2005, it took me three years to get a visa, okay? This was the deal. I had to allow two of the security police to go with me everywhere I went. 
they said the purpose of the security police was to protect me from militants. And of course, I knew part of the purpose of the security police was to keep an eye on what I was doing. But they actually did protect me once. I'm out for a walk with my interpreter. A man steps up to me, nose touching my nose, starts screaming at me. And I mean, I didn't know what he was saying. He was screaming in Arabic, but I got the idea. Interpreter tried to, to talk to him and stop him, but there were two security police following me about 20 feet behind. The security police drew their guns, stepped up and showed their badges, and he backed off. So they actually did protect me on one occasion. So I asked my interpreter, I said, I got the general idea, but what was he saying? And, and he said, he was saying you were an infidel and you were walking on his street and he would cut your head off. And the security police backed him off. And the two drawn pistols, I think, had an impact on this, deciding to step back. Um, he believed he had the right, but just because I was an infidel, to kill me. And he'd have a reward in eternity if he did. Uh -huh. And, and uh, so a lot of the time the security police were a nuisance on that particular day. I bought their supper. I mean, I, they, I was really happy they were there. Well, people need to recognize that this man's threat was absolutely consistent with Oslo Doctrine. <coughs> If he had killed me, that too would have been completely consistent with Muslim doctrine. Here's another quote from the Surah. Fight them on until there is no more tumult, seduction, or oppression, and there prevail justice, faith in Allah, and the religion becomes Islam. My home of Chicago, there are billboards promising that if everyone will follow Islam, that will bring about peace. It would bring about peace in the sense they would not have to fight opposition anymore. Islam declares they want peace. The only prerequisite is that we submit to Allah in order to have, and submit to Islam in order to have that peace. The Hadith again. Muhammad said, I'm in order to fight with the people till they say, none has the right, uh, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. And from the Surah, O oh, ye who believe, fight those of the disbelievers who are near you, and let them find harshness in you, and know that Allah is with those who keep their duty unto Him. Get the idea? They were taught to carry out military activity against non-Muslims. Right. This is part of their religion. This is not a handful of terrorists who have corrupted a religion. This is the religion. And that is what needs to be faced in the Western world in countries like the Philippines. Uh, just just example, you, you, this morning's news. The Islamic, Mora Islamic Front, or whatever the exact name is, your country is negotiating peace with them. Mm -hmm. right. During the middle of the negotiations, they go out and help ambush and kill 40-some of your police. Yes. Right. You can negotiate peace with them. When the negotiations are done, they're still going to believe they should kill you. And sitting at a table with them doesn't bring peace. What you were talking to be blatantly obvious this right. morning. Chicago also has a number of Muslims. Many live in my neighborhood and there are several walks nearby. People may say the local Muslims are not practicing these things, which is true, they're not. Have the laws of the United States will not permit it. But look at the areas of the world where it's permitted and observe what they practice. Okay. On Friday night, the show, when, when the mosques have their service, the Chicago police have extra patrols. Because they know that some of the imams are preaching violence. And they want everybody to know that if you're tempted to carry out the preaching of the imam, the, the police are out in full force on Friday night. And some people have criticized the police department for doing that. But to me, it makes an awful lot of sense. To have it, we, we have policemen in our church, but we have revival and have service on Friday night. None of our policemen are there. They're all on patrol. But to me, that makes a lot of sense. And that is one reason you're not seeing these acts of violence very much. 
you are seeing people in Chicago put ISIS flags places. Okay? And, and uh, the Chicago police are not being politically correct. They're being extra thoughtful. And I, for one, am very grateful to them. Okay? Ephraim Karsh writes in Islamic Imperialism, as a universal religion, Islam envisages a global political order in which all humankind will live in a uh, Muslim world as either believers or uh, subject communities. <coughs> Excuse me. In order to achieve this goal, it's incumbent on all free male adult Muslims to carry out our uncompromising struggle in the path of Allah or Yahweh. <coughs> now again, I know Muslims who I think have no interest in jihad at all. In fact, the longer they live in the United States, the less interest they have. They're making good money, they're buying things, they're enjoying luxuries they never had before. They don't want to give all that up to fight war. They like living in the comfort. But, I said, those are the ones I know. Those are the ones that are easy to talk to. Those are the ones that are around. They're also on my block. Muslim family where the women are required to wear burqas and they're not even allowed to say hi to you or accept a gospel track or acknowledge your existence. Uh, I kind of wonder what those folks would be like if they had the opportunity. There, there is an element, and I think in the United States among Muslims that live there, a growing element, but it is by no means everybody. We saw, uh, seen acts of terror by Muslims in, in recent years in the United States that our government would not admit were acts of terror. We had what we call, some of this I have here and I'll read it, but some of the things are not there. We had what we call the Beltway Bomber, our Beltway Snipers. And it was two guys driving around Washington, D.C. in a car. Uh, they had a sniper rifle. One of them would drive and the other one would shoot people at random. Hop back, you know, get out, fire a shot, kill somebody, hop back in a car. And go. It took them a while to find these people. They killed a number of folks. The they FBI profiler said, these are probably some angry, disaffected Christians. Uh, when they caught them, they were both Muslim. They were doing it in the name of Yihad. They said in their trial that they were doing this in obedience to the Quran. But in, in, in the, uh, they said this in the trial, but the American officials are saying, we don't believe there's any connection between their religion and these murders. Even though they were saying in the trial, they did it to carry out Yihad and kill them believers. There was an army recruiter standing outside an army recruiting office that a Muslim shot and killed while shouting Allah Akbar. And he's prosecuted for murder, but again, the authorities said they didn't believe his religion had anything to do with it. Imagine what they do if, if a Christian killed somebody and then said, in the name of Jesus. Yes. You know. And uh, the Boston bombers who, who, who set up bombs in Boston Marathon year before last. Two Muslim brothers who claimed to be carrying out jihad, and still the news media would say nobody can find the reason they did it. In, at Fort Hood, Texas, a Muslim sergeant in the American military took a gun with an automatic clip into a no-gun region and shouting Allah Akbar, started mowing people down, killing 13 and wounding a large number. The United States government described it as workplace violence rather than terrorism. But our government said, well, his religion didn't have apartments. incredibly blind to what's abundantly obvious. I don't know if the guy in Syria really intended to choose at that moment to cut my head off, or he was just trying to scare me. He wasn't holding a knife that I could see. So maybe he was just trying to scare me. But I still felt pretty good when the two security police stepped out, guns drawn and badges out. You know, I said, we're happy to have them there at that particular moment. They were in the way some of the time, but at that moment they were welcome. I bought their dinner. And they were more than welcome. This is there and it's real. 
no matter how hard you try to hide from it. Well, here's some other commentary on this. The term for all parts of the world not yet conquered by the House of Islam, such as the United States, is the House of War. They consider the Philippines the House of War. Right. Right? That means there's supposed to be a war here to use some Nidal. In the West, we come blind our history. 2006 in Canada, 17 Muslim young men were arrested for being part of a terror cell. The newspaper report said, however, said they could not find any unifying factor which would draw these men together in committing these kinds of crimes. Yet not only were they all Muslim, they all attended the same mosque. In England, the very significant well-armed cell was also broken up, comprised entirely of Muslims who belonged to two or three particular mosques noted for their radicalism. Incredibly, both the English government and the English paper said they could not find any reason to believe their religion played a part in this. So it's a coincidence that all these Muslims going to the same mosque get together to plot acts of terror. Yeah. The term for the defense or advancement of Islam by force is jihad. It is often said that jihad is not an offensive term, only defensive, because holy wars can only be fought in self-defense. A current Muslim publication devoted its theme to saying that Christians are purposely misrepresenting Islam. The publication said that holy war jihad can only be fought in self-defense from those trying to destroy Islam. I, I got that because some years ago I, I uh, subscribed to the publications of CARE, which is supposedly a peaceful Muslim group in the United States, and they send out a number of magazines. I gave them a fake name and my address. So I get their stuff in the mail. So they, they, they put out a monthly magazine. And one whole magazine was devoted to saying that we're lying about the Muslims because they never go on offense. They only fight in defense. And if they only fight against those trying to destroy. But if you finish the article, the article went on to reveal that those threatening Islam specifically are France, Canada, and the United States. So that's who's trying to destroy us. So any act against the French, Canadians, United States was an act in defense. And there's no evidence of Muslims being executed or imprisoned for their faith in any of these areas. Their concept of an attack on Islam is not submitting to Allah, at which point they may fight back in self-defense, which means they can fight against every non-Muslim and call it self-defense. The record of history does not illustrate Islam as one of the world's peaceful religions. Man. It just doesn't. That's not the record. That's not what happened. It is a religion that has violence at its core. And while some Muslims do not no, no longer accept the core of that violence, many Muslims do. Many Muslim teachers do. This is why the current president of Egypt just spoke to a conference of Islamic religious leaders and said, if we don't abandon the concept of conquest, we will never be at peace with the world. But that's one Muslim leader. Giving credit for it. But that's one Muslim leader. And at no point did these religious leaders say that they agreed with him. They said they would say, all we're doing is defending ourselves against those who don't believe. So what are those who don't believe doing to threaten you? They're not believing. So all of you today are a threat to them. So consequently, killing you would just be in favor of all. Now, now one of the questions I'm asked a lot, how do you know which groups of Muslim are peaceful and which not? And frankly, somebody should do a massive study of all the different versions to, to see what they're teaching. I don't know the answer to that. I'm not in favor of reacting against Muslims in general. But I also think you can't hide from the fact this is going on. Right. And, and so when the Chicago police puts out extra patrols on Friday night about the time the mosques get out, I think it's a really good idea. Peaceful Muslims aren't going to be bothered by the police. That's, that's a really good idea. Facing what we're dealing with, stopping, stop pretending Islam is not dangerous and that it's a peaceful religion. The mosques where they do preach peace are going against the Quran. 
Good for them. I'm not in favor of locking them up or anything, but good for them that they're going against the crime. But there's a whole lot of folks that are going to be obedient to it no matter what. And we have to face that. Let's take a 10 minute break. Fred. Throughout its history, it's an early Islamic conquest in section. Islam has been spread by the sword, not by preaching, persuasion, or negotiation. Right. <coughs> <coughs> Abu Bakr, successor to Muhammad, ruled from 632 to 634 AD. He was succeeded by Caliph Omar, 634 to 640 AD. Under Omar, Islam conquered Syria, Palestine, Persia, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Cyrene, and Tripoli, encompassing North Africa and most of the Middle East. That back in ten years, these were all these territories were all taken in battle. When you you read later about the Crusaders coming to the Holy Land and, and Muslims said, "Well, they tried to come take the Holy Land by force. How did the Muslims get it? By force. None of these places were reached by persuasion to Islam and its other people." In fact, outside of the original Medina area, there's no place in the history of the world which became Islamic without military force. And they're not trying to spread without military force now. Look at what's going on in Nigeria with Boko Haram. They're trying to take Nigeria by force. Under Caliph Othman, 645 to 656 AD, Islam took the islands of Cyprus and Rhodes. Islamic armies also invaded Afghanistan. Under Caliph Muawai, 661-680 AD, Islamic armies invaded and conquered part of India. Under Caliph Yagin I, Islamic armies spread Muslim control across North Africa to Morocco. Caliph Adil Abelik sent military forces to seize Tunisia. During the 8th century, Muslim forces seized Asia Minor, Turkestan, more of India, and began to aggressively attack the Byzantine Empire. Also in the 8th century, Islam began its invasion of Europe. Using Gibraltar as a base, which was named after a Muslim general, Muslim armies invaded Spain. The Muslims quickly conquered most of Spain, which they held for 750 years. Islam began to invade France. They were stopped decisively by Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours in 732 AD. This is one of the most important battles in world history. If the Franks under Martel had not won, Europe would probably become Muslim. The history of the world would have been changed dramatically. If at that period of time, Europe had become Muslim, there would not have been any Christians coming across the ocean to establish new colonies. Any new colonies would have been Muslim. If Islam had not been stopped by Charles Martel at Tours, many historians believe that Islamic armies would have swept across all of Europe. Historian John Clark Ridpath describes the decisive battle. Europe was arrayed against Asian Africa, the cross against the crescent, Christ against Muhammad. But on the seventh day of the fight, the terrible Germans arose with their battle axes upon the lighter soldier of the south and hewed them down by the thousands. Night closed upon victorious Europe. Charles had won his surname of the hammer, for he had been followers of the prophet into the earth. Beating the followers of the prophet into the earth. You don't read history books and describe a peaceful Islam. That is not how it progressed. There was non-stop war between Islam and the West. There always has been since the foundation of Islam. Later Islamic campaigns in the Middle Ages. Battles between different factions of Islam slowed down their attempts at expansion. During the Crusades, Islamic armies had to fight to maintain their previous conquest of Palestine. Although the Crusaders were only able to temporarily take back the Middle East, these battles demanded the devotion of Islam's resources, hindering them from further expansion and conquest. So well, the, the Europeans lost the Crusades, in a sense. The goal was to reclaim the Holy Land. They only reclaimed it for a short while. 
But during the time of the Crusades, Islam was having to devote its attention to maintaining its control of the Holy Land. They don't conquer anywhere new. They're fighting to maintain what they've got. And, and, and during the United States wars with Iraq, when, when Muslim groups were pouring their fighters into Iraq, they weren't expanding. However, problems of our days, no, nobody's ever seen this as a war against militant Islam. It was a war against Saddam Hussein. Nobody knew what to do when they took Saddam out of war. And we knew what was to come after. Well, the Mongols swept through Eastern Asia in the 13th century. Their leader took the name Genghis Khan, meaning universal leader. He conquered a great deal of Muslim territory. Khan announced, I am the punishment of God. If you had not committed great sins, God would not have sent a punishment like me upon you. He taught he was destined by God to control the whole earth. Genghis Khan was not the first to dream of this, not the first to fail. Genghis Khan's successors conquered Russia and much of Eastern Asia. Muslim armies were uh, preoccupied with trying to preserve part of the Islamic Empire and unable to continue invading Europe for a time. Further Islamic invasions of Europe will come later once they no longer must devote all of their strength to dealing with the Mongols. Having taken much of the Muslim territory, Mongol leaders over a period of time converted to Islam. When the greatest Mongol leader Tamerlane conquered much of Central Asia in the early 14th century, he did so in the name of Allah. He's been Muslim ever since. We recently had a, a young lady saved at our church from Kazakhstan. She fled Kazakhstan. She had been, uh, um, she was not Muslim because she personally had looked at Muslim Islam and rejected it. But her parents were arranging a marriage for her to a devout Muslim. So she skipped the country, came to the United States to keep from being forced any marriage to a Muslim where she would be one of four wives. And when she got to the United States, uh, somebody on an airplane witnessed to her on the way to the United States and told her to find a Baptist church. And then she did, and, and we got to tell her about Christ, and she trusted Christ in faith. But she fled because she did not want to live under the tyranny of Islam. That entire region, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, uh, several large countries that don't normally make the news very much, all that was conquered by Tamerlane and brought under the control of Islam, and is Islamic to this day. Well... After the collapse of the Mongol Empire, the Turks under the command of Osman Bey seized control of most of the Muslim Empire. This new version of Islam was known as the Ottoman Empire. Now they're, they're trying as an empire to build armies on European level and use that as the basis for conquering the world for Islam. Uh, in, it would last until World War I in which the Ottoman Empire would fight on the side of the Germans. The, the Germans offered them, if they were victorious, all the European colonies in Africa. And so they fought on the side of Germany and Italy, but they lost. The Allies, the United States and England, purposely broke up the Ottoman Empire into several small Muslim countries. So there would be no Muslim country strong enough to pursue conquest. This was effective for a time, which is why the West has forgotten the nature of Islam. Everybody in the Western world knew Islam was the conquering enemy. For centuries, nobody would ever have suggested it was peaceful. I mean, that, that, was, that was the enemy you were always having to fight. And, um, but the reason people forgot after World War I, the Ottoman Empire was broken up into a lot of small countries. Kuwait was created, Iraq was created, Saudi Arabia was created, Bahrain was created. And, and they just sort of sat in a room with maps and drew the boundaries. There was nothing consistent. One of the reasons ever since then Iraq has been in a constant state of civil war is they took three groups of people who did not like each other, have anything to do with each other, and made them a country. 
that no common language, that different versions of Islam, that history of fighting. They said, okay, you guys are a country together. And still, the three groups, the Shia, the Sunni, and the Kurds, fight each other in Iraq. Have nonstop. Even in the most recent setting, one of the things that's happened is, is where the Kurds have the most effective militias and they have resisted ISIS. And we have sent military aid to the Kurds through Baghdad. It never gets to the Kurds. The Shia who are in control of Baghdad take all the military equipment for themselves. They don't care if the Kurds get massacred. To this day, nothing unites them. During the two Gulf Wars, the Kurds fought with the United States to overthrow Saddam Hussein. They, they artificially made these countries. When they artificially made these countries, they picked local leaders and made them kings. So we, we just saw this week, the king of Saudi Arabia passed away. His family's been the royal family since 1918, when the British and French and Americans redo the map and, and broke up the Ottoman Empire to a lot of countries. This was a local ruler. They gave his main king and said, this is yours. Made somebody else the king here, and somebody else the king there, and somebody else the king there. It was a completely artificial map that had only one goal. Break up Muslim strength. So there was not one large, strong Muslim nation to lead the quest for conquest. After these nations were all broke up, in 1918. They were not strong enough to try and conquer. So there was peace from about 1918 till the terrorist movement of the 1970s. And during that roughly 50 years, people forgot what Islam was like. Their parents knew, their grandparents knew, their great-grandparents knew. The folks of 200 years ago knew, and the folks of 500 years ago knew, and the folks of 1,000 years ago knew, but when you had about 50 years of peace, everybody forgot. But the only reason you had peace is the Allies took away all their strength by breaking them up into small countries. And, and that is when, in the 1970s, certain leaders began to say, we'll conquer the world without doing it through a nation. Others, like the Ayatollahs in Iran, said Iran will lead the Muslim conquest. Saddam Hussein had the vision because he thought he was Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. He had the vision that Iraq would become, would unite all of the Arab nations into one country. And they would, they would be a, uh, an economic superpower because of oil. He wanted to develop nuclear weapons. And they would be a military superpower because of nuclear weapons. And then the, the new all Arab nation headed by Saddam Hussein would be the force for Islam conquering the world. Several things got in his way. When he had a flourishing nuclear program in 1981, Israel bombed it out of existence. They were trying to rebuild it, but they never recovered from what Israel did to him. And, and, and um, one of the things the Israelis did, besides using missiles, they literally, planes, the, the Muslims believe that pig's blood desecrates anything, they flew over some of the nuclear facilities and dropped pigs from airplanes, who then splattered all over the nuclear facility. Um, but Saddam Hussein was you know, committed to rebuilding them. Well, then he tried to invade Iran as part of conquering the Islamic world. That failed. So then he tried something smaller, Kuwait, smaller country right there next to Iraq. And they conquered Kuwait. That is when the first President Bush got up public and said, this will not stand. And, and the United States went into the first Gulf War and threw them out of Kuwait. Saddam Hussein had a long history of failures. But that was his dream. He would recreate the Islamic Empire with him as the leader. ISIS is also trying to recreate the Islamic Empire using some of Muhammad's original tactics with the goal uh, of becoming the dominant form of Islam, they're different than Al-Qaeda, which they broke from in this sense. Al-Qaeda said, we want to unite all Muslims in this cause. Uh, ISIS says, we will destroy all Muslims who don't believe in our way of doing it. 
So they have become more violent even than Al-Qaeda, which is looking for as many allies as they can get. So you could come from any of the versions of Islam to Al-Qaeda and be accepted. In ISIS, they're, they're killing Muslims as quick as they're killing anybody else if you're not their kind of Muslim. And, and with aggressiveness, they had an incredible amount of success. And, and they have a number of strategies, like the taking of hostages. And, and they have done things like seize oil wells, and instead of destroying the oil wells, they operate them, sell the oil. They seize banks. And instead of looting them, they operate them and make money off the banks. They use social media a lot. I mean, there's a lot of different things about ISIS but it's still the same dream, conquest of the world in the name of Islam. They, again, these groups have fought each other over who does what, but nonetheless, I mean, this is what it's about. Well, again, it was from 1918 to the 1970s when Islam wasn't strong enough to be violent that people forgot its violent nature. Well, the Muslims formed special military units out of the sons of Christians who had been scripted into Islamic armies. They became a military elite known as the Janissaries. Most of these young men were taken by force from the homes of Christians who lived in the Middle East or during raids in Europe. Once taken, these young men were raised from children to become warriors, although entirely composed of men having Christian background. They were raised to believe that death in the service of Allah was the highest calling. The Janissaries were raised to never show fear and to accept the idea that their lives would be offered in a moment. During the siege of Malta in 1565, needing to bridge a gap between the attacking forces and fortifications, the Janissaries were ordered to run into the gap and die, so there would be so many bodies that it created a bridge the others could cross. And they did. They did as commanded. The Janissaries became quite a fierce fighting force trained to be totally loyal to the Emperor. The Ottoman Empire began to chip away the Byzantine Empire with one conquest after another. Finally, in 453 AD, after a 53-day siege, Constantinople fell, and the Byzantine Empire was no more. Winston Churchill, understanding the situation well, would write, Mohammedanism is a militant and proselyting faith. It has already spread throughout Central Asia raising fearless warriors at every step, and were it not that Christianity is sheltered in the strong arms of science, the civilization of modern Europe might fall, as fell the civilization of ancient Rome. He said, look, they've always been militant, they've always been proselyting, they've always tried to advance through conquest, and he said, if we did not have the advancements of science, they might well conquer Europe. You see the same issue today when the biggest threat to militant Islam today is the United States Air Force. They don't have any planes. They don't have advanced technology. It is the advancements of science that has kept them at bay. And, and um, God help us if they ever get past all that. Winston Churchill recognized the advantage of the West. Christianity sheltered the strong arm of science. Islam has not made scientific advances because in Islam you're taught to submit to the way things as they are because that's the will of Jehovah. You submit. But science requires you to do what? The Bible commands people to subdue the earth, not to submit to the conditions that are there, but to change them. And so science has come out largely out of Christianity because we have a command from God to study natural forces, to learn how to harness them, to learn how to use them. ISIS has been somewhat different in their attempts. They seized planes, but they don't have pilots. And, and learning to handle a modern jet fighter is not a simple prospect. Very complicated technology. You need to know lots of math and science. They've captured planes, they've captured missiles, and they've captured other complicated uh, scientific military equipment, but they haven't figured out how to use it yet. Now, next. Charlemagne, typical German of the day, was a large and tall man, vigorous of mind and body, and a powerful warrior. 
He considered the Pope to be his subject and treated him as such. He was ready for his own reasons to bring autonomous churches like the Bavarian Church under the papal power since it simply served to unify his own realm. For the same reason, he forced Christianity on the last pagan German nation, Saxony. And literally, his armies uh, marched the people to the river, ordered them to be baptized as Christians. Anybody refusing was killed. Thousands and thousands of people. He wanted to create the Holy Roman Empire. He wanted to revive the Roman Empire, but revive it in the name of Christianity. Hence the name Holy Roman Empire. And in doing so, he wanted to unite by persuasion or conquest, whatever it took, all of professing Christianity, which made him the ultimate enemy to Islam. Here he is uniting much of Europe in the name of, of his version of Catholicism. They're uniting the Mideast and North Africa in the name of their version of Islam. So they become the ultimate enemies to each other for a period of time. Well, the rise of the Franks in the Islamic invasions. Two dynamics which combine to change Europe forever. The rise of Islam in the East and the rise of the Franks, who were the first real imperial power in the West since Rome. The rise of Islam led to Islamic invasions of Europe and the conquest of Iberia, the peninsula encompassing Spain and Portugal. This rise of Islam also began a long, slow slide into the extinction of the Byzantine Empire, although the Eastern Roman Empire would endure for another 700 years. The coming of Islam had the unexpected result of shifting Christian power decisively to the West. And the, the, the Roman Empire had broken up into the Eastern and Western part. The Western part collapsed. You had all these Christian, quote unquote Christian nations. The East, the Byzantine, remained an empire, but it was constantly being attacked by the Muslims who sapped its strength. So the strength of Christianity would move into France and Germany and England and the strength of professing Christianity it moved to the West. Also in the West, under the Franks, the first beginning of a new order arose with the Carolinians. The Carolinians began as mayors of the palace for the Frankish kings, but eventually came to be more important than the kingdoms they served. At their onset, these Carolinians were merely Romanized Germanic barbarians, civilized to some degree by Christianity. They gradually evolved into a central government controlled by the Carolinian nobility which actually ruled the Franks. This system developed under Charles Martel. As mayor of the palace, Charles Martel had led the Frankish invasion against uh, Islam. Triumphantly, he halted the tide of Islamic expansion and subsequently took his family to heights of power and recognition. He was given the name Martel, which means hammer, because he hammered Islam's advance to a complete stop. Charles Martel was also a skilled administrator who he organized what would become the medieval European government, a system of fiefdoms, loyal to barons, counts, and dukes, and ultimately the king. His close coordination of the church with state also began the medieval pattern of such government. Martel created the first Western standing army since the fall of Rome. And nations didn't have armies, they called their citizens up at time of need. Martel creates a standing army for one specific purpose to prevent the Islamic invasions of the world. created a professional army functioning full-time 12 months out of the year. This was significant for the defense of the people. One reason the Spanish armies were unable to stop the Muslims was that, that their sole defense was local militia. And local militia wanted to fight where? They want to fight until it came to their neighborhood, their town, their region. So they're constantly trying to resist the Muslims in small groups. And small groups could resist the Muslims. You had to be willing to create a large enough body of men, which meant fighting outside your own neighborhood. This was no match for the professional full-time soldiers of Islam. Charles Martel had created a standing army able to balance the scales and stand up against the Islamic invaders. In essence, he changed Western Europe from a horde of barbarians fighting with one another to an organized state. Martel defeated Muslim invading armies of Tours, Arles, and Riverbear, 
with the first battle stopping the advance and the next to consolidate the victory. These critical battles stopped the Islamic tide while the caliphate was still united. He actually took the battle into the areas the Muslims had conquered, taking the battle to them, making them fight to hold on to what they had, thus preventing them to, to uh, have conquests that would allow them to take more. <coughs> Although Charles Martel was technically mayor of Paris and serving for the king, he gained power through the Islamic defeat. This placed him for all practical uh, purposes in position as king. This set the stage for his son Pippin the Short. And, and, and one of the interesting things of that age is men were not given their permanent name until after they died. And, and so Charlemagne, Charles the Magnificent, was never called Charlemagne in his lifetime. The, the names were how we remember. So you have Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer. You have Charlemagne, Charles the Magnificent. But you got a bunch of other interesting kings like Pepin the Short. That's what they remember about him after he was dead. He was short. They also had kings like Charles the Bald, Charles the Fat, and Charles the Child. And I looked up Charles the Child. I thought maybe he died when he was a child. And so that's him. He died when he was 62. They remember him as Charles the Child, which tells you something about all these folks. Well, Pippin the Short uh, to assume the Frankish throne, his grandson to assume the title of the first Western Roman Emperor since Rome's fall three centuries before. Charles Martel had effectively eliminated the guise of mayor, officially establishing his son as king, and starting a new dynasty with a new lineage. Now, moving on, again, we're going to look at Judaism for a little bit because it fits in central to the story. There are approximately three million people on this earth, of whom 12 million, less than one half of 1%, are classified as Jews. Statistically, they should hardly be heard of, like the Aiden who tucked away in the corner of Asia bystanders of history. But the Jews are heard totally out of proportion to their small numbers. God has given to the Jewish nation substantial role and substantial recognition which he maintains throughout history. To put it differently, as furniture in the Western world is Grecian, but the house in which Western man dwells is Jewish. And then you, you got a lot of the, the furniture, the incidentals of Western culture from the Greeks. But the overall system comes from the Jews, and especially when you recognize where does Christianity come out of? The first Christians were what? Jews. And considered to be a sect of Judaism. Okay? That's not what they were. They were established with something brand new. But in terms of world history, people considered them a sect of Judaism first. <coughs> this reference to Christianity being introduced to the Western world. Okay? While there are small evidences of Grecian influence from throughout the Western world, the structure of culture is Judeo-Christian. As with all conspiracy theories, once the first imaginative jump is made, the rest follows with intoxicating logic. Conspiracy theories about the Jewish people are repeatedly used as justification for persecuting Jews. Recent admitted ad speeches in the United Nations alluded several times to various Jewish conspiracies. It's amazing how many conspiracy theories have been advanced in reference to the Jews in different places, times, countries, and cultures. For example, one of the admitted ad theory. I mean, he didn't invent this it's been around for centuries, but that he brought to the UN was the idea that when the, the Jews have their holiday, Passover holiday, their bread is made with the blood of faith. Okay? Completely untrue, but just, they'll tell you, when you get near the Passover, or watch your babies because the Jews want to kidnap your babies and kill them and drain their blood and use that blood in the making of the bread they use in the Passover. Okay? Completely false, but if you believe that, that would affect how you behave towards them. Dramatic. Well, challenges faced by Judaism during the Middle Ages. There were multiple challenges faced by the Jewish people in Europe. One of these challenges was the situation left behind by the collapse of the Greek or Roman Empire. We'll get to Islam in just about half a page here. And they're part of it. A variety of pagan tribes remained within the empire. 
all opposing the idea of one God who ordained the moral code. A single God is not easily received because with many gods come men in moral codes. You can pick the one you want. Whatever a person wants to do in a multiple God society, a God may be found to endorse his chosen lifestyle. Remember my telling you the story earlier about being in a God story in Trinidad. You could pick a God that stood for whatever you wanted. Okay? You say, well, what would I want a God to stand for? And then you pick one that fits. Well, this is what happens in a pagan society. Whatever a person wants to do in a multiple God society, a God may be found to endorse his chosen lifestyle. The people of these cultures enjoyed their option of choosing their religion and lifestyle. The Jews, however, were not to enter into paganism or bring in pagans as a part of them. As a result, Judaism developed distinctly from the tribes around it. And one of the reasons the Jews are so resented, the Jews are saying, this is the right behavior and this is the right conduct. For example, in Rabbi, sex confined to marriage. How do you think the countries or the groups or the tribes that did not believe that felt about people who taught that? How did they feel? They resented it because it said, in essence, every time you looked at a Jew, it was saying, you're wrong. Your morals are wrong. Your culture is wrong. And, and the attitude wasn't reasonable for people to be moral. The Jews would say the issue is not reason. The issue is thou shalt not commit adultery in the Ten Commandments, etc. And you find the same thing today. People that stand for a biblical moral code don't have to say anything or do anything to make people mad. The fact that you're there reminds people of their sin. And people do not wish to be reminded of their sin. Well, and then, of course, Paul, many, many other areas. Christianity later created another challenge for the Jews. Initially, Christianity was seen as part of Judaism and drew many Jews voluntarily into it. It's our membership. However, the later development of state Christianity, not real Bible Christianity, but Christianity began to emerge with the state, required everyone to identify with the state church. Baptism became the method of gaining citizenship. Unconverted Jews, however, refused baptism. Understandable. For this reason, persecution of the Jews became common in those spread. Two minor primary approaches within Judaism began to develop and attempt to adjust. One focused on the idea of strict orthodoxy and the idea of Judaism as a culture within a culture. They said, we're going to be orthodox, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to dress, this is how we're going to live, this is how we're going to worship. And, and even though there's a broad Roman Catholic culture around us, we will be a culture within a culture. Ironically enough, I mentioned I live in a, a neighborhood of Chicago with a lot of mosques. There are also a lot of synagogues. They're in the same neighborhood. And uh, there is a significant group of Orthodox Jews in the neighborhood where I live. And not only do they have their um, synagogue services on Sabbath, Saturday, Friday night, Saturday, they dress in distinct Orthodox fashion for that. You can spot them a lot of way. They wear black outfits. The ladies' dresses are very modest. The men wear black hats. Um, and they're distinctly dressed. And you can tell in an instant that Orthodox Jews. It's obvious. They couldn't be anything else in the way they're dressed. A culture within a culture. Well, the second approach involved the development of secular Judaism. This approach to Judaism urged Jews to adjust to the culture they were in. The Talmud was developed and served as a unifying force for both branches of Judaism. The Talmud is, in effect, a commentary in the Old Testament, although there is much within it that does not really come from the Old Testament. Have the complete Talmud set of commentaries on the Old Testament that were being thrown away by the widow of Jewish rabbi, and which, which I was able to get hold of. Well, the Talmud is, in effect, a commentary on the Old Testament. All through guidelines and applications, the Talmud offers instruction to the Jewish people on how to behave in the middle of a non-Jewish world. Give you an example. So many Jews in our, our my neighborhood, and there are many Jewish schools. But secular Jews will send their children to the same public school as everybody else. 
That's part of the adjustment. They go to the secular school. They go to public school. They will dress the same as everybody else. Their goal in, in survival and avoiding persecution is to be like the general population. When, when the Orthodox Jews and some other specific branches of Judaism said, we're going to develop separately as a culture within a culture. The other Jews said, we're going to blend into society. So you see the Orthodox Jewish girls dressed very modestly. The secular Jewish girls are wearing whatever's fashionable at the moment. The Orthodox Jewish uh, children have their own schools. The secular Jews go to the public schools. Two different approaches. In both cases, they're trying to figure out how to deal with what's going on around them. And, and this will lead us right in, into having to deal with Islam in just a moment. Well, the Jews next began to face several challenges developing from Islam. Islam had originally begun as an emphasis on monotheism. This attracted the cooperation from Jewish tribes in Arabia, rallying a monotheist prophet. Okay? Soon, however, this prophet had created an entirely new religion and began persecuting the Jews. Prior to this persecution, Judaism willingly attracted loyalty from many tribes which are not Hebrew in origin. The experience with Islam, though, caused Jews to become fearful of drawing non-Hebrew tribes into Judaism, and the Jews turned inward. They no longer made an attempt to convert Gentiles to the religion of Judaism. Following Islam's persecution, Judaism became strictly for ethnic Hebrews. There is a period of time before Islam where Judaism is, is spreading, growing, drawing all kinds of Arabian tribes into identification as Jews. But after their experience with Muhammad, they began to cut themselves off from anybody that was not born Hebrew. And Judaism turns inward and is no longer an expansive, growing religion. While Islam sometimes violently persecuted Jews, more commonly the Jews were expected to pay a special tax. This caused the Jews to often be welcomed in areas controlled by Islam. Even today, Islamic leaders have boasted their neighborhoods and areas such as Baghdad and Tehran, which are specifically for the Jews. These Jews are citizens, may serve in the army. They may hold government jobs and even some Jews in Iran's parliament. However, all of these people must pay a special tax to be permitted to live in Iraq or Iran. Saddam Hussein delighted to boast that Tariq Aziz, one of his key government leaders, was a Christian attempting to demonstrate that Iraq was actually a very tolerant nation. However, Christians too pay a special tax to live in Iraq or Iran. Routinely, synagogues and churches are given instructions about what they can and cannot preach, as well as what they can and cannot do. Christians and Jews do not enjoy any similarity to the measure of religious freedom given to Islam. Sometimes true that they are tolerated, not exterminated. The special tax is paid by Jews and Christians are beneficial to the government economy. Many times when Islam would conquer an area, they would allow the Jews to remain relatively unmolested in terms of physical violence. They allow them free to run their stores, business, trading caravans in exchange for the payment of a special tax. This tax is described in the Quran itself. The dimis is the term for that taxpayer. The one who's allowed to be there because they pay that special tax. Uh, Islamic invasions of Europe. From Ernie Bradford, what, what I think is the greatest history book I've ever read, called The Great Siege. The great advantage which the Muslims always had over Christians was their Eastern fatalism, reinforced by the certainty of their warriors, that paradise awaited the faithful who died in battle. As one historian has put it, the disregard of human life among the leaders of the Ottoman Turks at this time was almost incredible. To attain their end in war, they sacrificed thousands upon thousands of men with callous indifference. Again, you remember yesterday telling you about going to the Islamic funeral, in which they said it was a sin against Allah to mourn death? Because death was what Allah chose it. You were rebelling against Allah if you were sad at somebody's death. This fatalism, you're going to die when Allah chooses it, 
there's nothing you can do about it, was so reinforced in them. One, one European was later talking about an occasion where he was on a, a ship that was uh, uh, primarily the sailors of Moscow. They got captured by pirates. The pirates announced they were executing all of them. And he said the Islamic sailors showed no emotion because they'd been trained not to. This is the will of Allah. He just accepted it. He's trying to plot his escape and none of them are willing to help him because they're just accepting it. This is the will of Allah. He eventually did escape it and they didn't. Well, early Bradford. Islam today has become diplomatically referred to as a great religion of peace. This simply is not true. One of the inherent fundamental beliefs of Islam is the conquest of the world by force, which we've already illustrated. This was illustrated by the Islamic invasions of Europe and continues to be seen today. The Islamic theology has not changed. It still justifies a callous indifference toward the sacrifice of its own people as a most direct path to paradise. We'll see this later this morning. But Amenadad, when he was ruler of Iran, said he would willingly sacrifice half the population of Iran to wipe out Israel. 70 million people, he said, if it cost the death of 35 million, it would be worth it to destroy Israel. The Ottoman Empire. In the 15th century, Europe finally succeeded in driving Muslim armies out of Spain. Now, the Muslim dream of the conquest of Europe did not die. Most of the Muslim Empire was under the control of the Turks. Their leader, Sultan Suleiman I, was determined that his destiny was to conquer Europe for Islam. He described himself this way. He's Sultan of the Ottomans, Allah's deputy on earth, Lord of the lords of this world, possessor of men's necks. In other words, he got a head cut off when he chose King of believers and unbelievers, King of kings, Emperor of the East and West, Emperor of the Chakans and of great authority, Prince and Lord of the most happy constellation, Majestic Caesar, Seal of victory, Refuge of all the people in the whole world, the Shadow of the Almighty, Dispensing Quiet in the earth. These are not the peaceful words of a local leader. These words were spoken with a purpose and destiny to rule the entire world. Islam's goal is commanded by the Quran is to conquer the whole world for Allah and bring the whole world in submission to Allah. That cannot be negotiated with. It can only be defeated. The Turks refer to this man as Suleiman the Lawgiver. The Europeans call him Suleiman the Magnificent. Not because they thought he was good, but because he was very successful. He was a very, very successful military leader. He won hundreds of battles, conquering Mediterranean islands and Eastern European cities. He determined to capture Western Europe from his bases in Eastern Europe. The Siege of Vienna. 1529. Suleiman besieged the Austrian capital of Vienna with 120,000 men. Vienna, with its 300-year-old walls, was defended by 26 uh, thousand men under the command of a German mercenary, Nicholas Graf von Sam. All over Austria, Ottoman forces burnt villages, raped and pillaged. A tradition of European warfare, which was virtually always honored, was to allow a city under siege to evacuate its women, children, elderly, and sick to safety. Von Sam tried to evacuate many of his non-combatants, sending out wagons filled with women, children, the infirm, and the elderly, but they were overwhelmed by the Muslim armies. Most were killed or enslaved by the Ottomans. The defenders of Vienna, as Charles Martel before, saw themselves as the defenders of Christian Europe. They understood that the goal of Islam was the conquest of the world. And they understood what was at stake. They understood what was going on. Only recently, during the last 40 or 50 years in Western Europe and the United States, that multiculturalists tried to paint a picture of all religions advocating peace and brotherhood. There's nothing in the Quran which teaches that, and nothing in the history of the world which confirms peace and brotherhood throughout Islam, or through Islam. The defenders of Vienna understood they were preventing Islam from coming into Western Europe. Again, how does the history of the world change if the Muslims take Europe? 
Reigns delayed the Ottoman army's attack on Vienna for two months. This allowed for dramatic improvements in the defense of the city. While the Ottoman army attacked, they began to bark Vienna with 300 cannons simultaneously. The defenders responded with a surprise cavalry attack. The Ottoman army then began to dig tunnels for planting explosives which could break down the walls. The defenders dug counter tunnels, hoping to cross the tunnels of the Ottoman Empire army and prevent them from actually reaching the city. This often led to fighting underground in brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. One tunnel would cross another, and the soldiers would go into the other side of the tunnel, and you had underground battles. Some historians have referred to this as the Siege of the Moles. But this one was fighting was going around. For a month, fierce fighting raged underground with breaches in the wall and in the fields and pastures around Vienna. A final charge by all the Muslim forces was turned back with great losses of life on both sides, including Bonsai. Over 25,000 Muslim soldiers were killed in the siege. Suleiman attempted another campaign in 1532, though it never reached the city. It was bogged down by so much rain, they could not move their wagons. We'll take a 10 minute break here, we'll come back, and we'll get to what I consider the most undertold historical story, the Siege of Malta. Okay? I fit with the politically correct current of our time. Twice already, we have seen Europeans, Charles Martel, in France and Spain area. Von Salo in the area of Vienna, Eastern Europe, stop advances of Muslim armies designed to conquer all of Europe. This is going to come up a third time, but this is going to be dramatically different. The Muslims are going to decide to try and conquer Europe by invading the southern part of France. By this time, the, the, the Spanish French border is heavily fortified. And Eastern Europe has some significant cities and fortifications. The southern part of France doesn't. They decide to put together an army to invade the southern part of France and, and use that as the way to conquer Europe. The relatively small island of Malta is ideally situated to be the base from which to attack France. And so Muslims decide they're going to uh, attack Malta Malta has about 1,000 soldiers and about 9,000 male inhabitants. And they're bringing an army of 80,000 to invade Malta. And they had some advance warning. There was thought of evacuating the island. There was thought of surrendering to the, to the Muslims who had promised to treat them with great care if they surrendered. But the men there realized that they are what is standing between Islam and the conquest of Europe. So they vow to die in Malta, resisting, rather than let Islam conquer Europe. We'll pick up with this. The siege of Malta is quite possibly the most important battle that's taken place in the history of the world. Yet in today's average world history book, the battle's not even mentioned. To include this story would require admitting that Islam wanted to conquer Europe this incredible story of sacrifice. Malta is a small Mediterranean island which did not have a large population. Because of its prime location, more than one natural harbor, Malta has often been thought of as an ideal place for attacking Europe. If Malta was conquered by Islam, its forces which were failing to get into Western Europe by way of the east could gain access by using the island of Malta as a naval base. From there they could reach what has been referred to as the soft underbelly of Europe, to invade France, Spain, Italy. A similar attempt was also tried in World War II by Hitler, by St. Prince. Malta was defended by a military order of the Knights of St. John. The original purpose had been to build hospitals and safe places of refuge for Christians in Palestine. They were expelled from Palestine, however, by the Muslims, settled the island of Rhodes. In 1522, Suleiman drove them out of Rhodes and they settled in Malta. The Knights took a vow of eternal warfare against Islam and operated a number of naval warships in the Mediterranean Sea. Malta had about 12,000 inhabitants and a nearby island, Gozo, was inhabited by about another 5,000. These people were of Philistine and Arabic descent, but they had been Christian since the visit of the Apostle Paul during the time of the New Testament. 
And he, he landed on the island of Melita, that's Malta, and God did a great work there. And, and the tribal people had been converted to Christianity, even though they're Arabic and even Philistine descent. 1564, 35 years after the siege of Vienna, the Sultan determined to seize Malta as a base for the invasion of Europe and Spain. For this relatively small island, a massive invasion force was prepared. The force encompassed 180 ships and 40,000 soldiers. Another 40,000 men in ships. Because of the knights and several European governments had spies all over the Islamic world, knowledge of the invasion plans did not take long to reach Malta. Jean Dallavet was the Grand Master of the Knights of St. John. This 70 year old man had served in the Knights for 50 years. He fought in the defense of Rhodes, captain the warship, was captured, spent over a year as a galley slave, and returned to captain another warship. For his defense of the island, Belay had about 600 members of the Knights of St. Malta, and about 7,400 male inhabitants of Malta. They would later receive about 900 Spanish soldiers and enforcement. With so few men, the Knights of St. John had little chance against the 40,000 soldiers preparing to invade. Normally, with such odds, a band so small would surrender and hope for mercy. Malay knew, though, that Southern Europe was not ready to stand a large-scale Muslim invasion. He felt the future of Christian Europe was in his hands and persuaded the Maltese that God had destined them to defend Christianity with their lives. Let told the men, in the great battle of the cross, it is the great battle of the cross and the Quran, which is now to be fought. A formidable army of infidels are on the point of invading our island. We, for our part, are the chosen soldiers of the cross. And if heaven requires the sacrifice of our lives, there can be no better occasion than this. Not exactly the story of dealing with a peaceful religion, is it? They chose to fight because they felt the future of Christian Europe was dependent on their successful defense of the island of Malta. Our current day and age, the Battle of the Cross and the Quran is again being fought. Imagine what would have happened in Malta if the 8,000 men capable of defending the island were divided among themselves as to whether it was their own fault the invaders were coming, whether the invaders' real purpose was actually a peaceful one, or whether these men of Malta would actually consider themselves truly Christians. That is how the Western world faces Islam today. Can you imagine them arguing, well, this is a peaceful religion, man. sending their army here. <laughs> Belay began to prepare for the battle. He improved fortifications, collected supplies, sent the elderly and infirm to shelter in Spain, and organized the island's defense. He ordered that every post was to be defended to the death, no position was to be abandoned, and no one was to surrender. Muslim soldiers arrived in Malta wearing gold bracelets with the following Arabic inscription. I do not come to Malta for wealth or honor, but to save my soul. They came to die in battle. Because dying in battle meant they went directly to paradise. They could skip hell. They could skip purgatory, if you will. Yeah, they said, well, they're all wearing bracelets made out of gold. They said, I came here to save my soul. These Muslim soldiers have come to die for Allah and do paradise. The ultimate issue is always the gospel. These men believed they were earning their way to paradise through the battle. Had they thought their salvation was through faith, they would never have undertaken this. The Muslim forces decided to take St. Elmo in one of five major fortifications first. They expected this to take two or three days. Surprisingly, though, the fort held out for 31 days. Every night, reinforcements slipped into the doomed fort under the cover of darkness. Over 1,500 defenders ultimately perished. Only five escaped. These defenders inflicted over 10,000 casualties on the attackers. Only one surrendered. Night after night, volunteers went into the fort with absolute assurance they were not going to come back out alive. They would fight to the death, and each night new volunteers would come in. There was no question these men believed they carried on their shoulders the entire future of Christianity in Europe. <coughs> and they were correct. Had Islam defeated Malta and taken Western Europe, the United States would never have been founded on Christian principles. Instead, the U.S. would be another nation whose people were slaves to Islam. 
Night after night, people whose names you and I have never read and never will read volunteered their lives to prevent Islam from taking Europe. In their sacrifice, they secured our future. It's an incredible story. This kind of thing you expect to make a movie out of. It. And yet it doesn't even get mentioned in history books. Defenders of the other fortifications turned back attacks day after day. Muslims began to publicly display the bodies of executed prisoners. In response, Malay beheaded his prisoners and shot their heads out of cannon. So this is not pretty, but there's no pretty way to fight a battle like this. Attackers are defended by the thousands. At the end of three months, the defenders had killed about 30,000 of the invading army. With the invading army diminished to less than 10,000, a defense relief force of 10,000 Spanish soldiers had at last arrived. After a final battle, the Turks withdrew. The southern part of Europe would not be invaded. They had won our freedoms as surely as anyone ever did. Yet their story today has been virtually ignored. So my all-time favorite history book in, in this sense, a man named Ernie Bradford wrote this. It is interesting and historical at the same time. He wrote it in such a fashion you can't put it down and start reading it. But it's history. They're very careful to be accurate. And again, he was not caught by the political correctness of our day. So this is portrayed as the ultimate sacrifice of these people to prevent Europe from being taken over by Islam, which is what it was. That story would not be accepted today because it would portray Islam as it actually is. Well, the Battle of Vienna. The Ottoman Empire had not given up on Europe. The Ottomans attempted to take Vienna again in 1683. Now this is the fourth time a battle is going to be fought that hinges upon keeping the Muslims from taking Europe. The Ottomans attempt to take Vienna again in 1683. They besieged the city during July, August, and September. For decades, the Ottomans have been providing support to any Catholic elements in Eastern Europe, even evangelical Protestants. They're so desperate to have a defeat the policy. An Ottoman army invaded Austria. Most of the inhabitants fled. 40,000 Muslim soldiers were resisted by 11,000 troops and 5,000 local militia. The besiegers dug tunnels to the wall and engaged in trench warfare. Large sections of the walls were blown up and Turks occupied parts of the city. Catholic and Protestant forces set aside their differences and came to the relief of Vienna. If the Catholics and Protestants had not stopped fighting one another, they would probably have been overrun by the Muslims. But they did look at this as much opposition as they had each other. They said anything would be better than having the Muslims rule Europe. But by the way, Muslims have a tactic for ruling Europe. A, what is it? Mass immigration. They're encouraging huge numbers of Muslims to go to Europe, encouraging them to have as many children as possible. They're, they're developing in places like France and England conclaves that are entirely Muslim under Sharia law. They're, they're planning the conquest of Europe through immigration today. And you're seeing results of that. For example, again, just since I've been in the Philippines, the terrorist activities in France and the fear that some of the terrorists got away into some of these no-go zones where the French police don't go. They're, they're taking over conclaves in Europe with the goal of ever expanding those. At, at some point, that has to be dealt with. Well, they've been fighting one another. <clears throat> they all understood the seriousness of Islam conquering Europe. Protestant and Catholic troops fought together on the same side. All of Western Europe was at risk. Islam is not devoted to peace. Islam is devoted to conquest. Both Protestant and Catholics understood their fate if Islam conquered Europe. The rescuing army was led by John III Sobieski, King of Poland. He led a charge that broke the siege. Paraphrasing the words of Caesar, who said, I came, I saw, I conquered. After his great victory, Sobieski said, I came, I saw, God conquered. Muslim forces continued to operate Eastern Europe, but they never again threatened to take control of the West. This is the background of much that is current. 
Many people watched the conflict of Serbia with Kosovo in the 1990s, wondering what all the fighting was about. Simply, there were three groups of people in that area of the world, the Catholics, the Orthodox, and the Muslims, who had been fighting one another for hundreds of years. Ironically, the United States took the side of the Muslims and fought to put Muslims in charge of Kosovo. The U.S. bombed Serbia, Yugoslavia, and Montenegro. I believe that was a horrible mistake. This is not to defend all that the Yugoslavians were doing. There's some horrible things being done by the government. Yet the Yugoslavian government was not so much a threat to worldwide freedom as Muslim control of Kosovo is. There are Muslims from Kosovo fighting in Afghanistan, Iraq, Chechnya, and Russia. Why as Christians do we need to study history? One of our fundamental responsibilities as Bible believers is to learn to view history from a Christian worldview. A Christian cannot, Christian worldview cannot be maintained if we hide from the facts of what has actually happened. What happens in a culture that looks at the world today and says there is no Islamic extremism, Muslim is a, Islam is a great, peaceful religion, and anybody who thinks otherwise is some sort of a religious thing. What happens in such a culture? The terrorists can do almost anything they want. They're not being resisted effectively or thoroughly. And you see that all over the place. Even when the United States overthrew the government of Iraq. Made no attempt to replace it with a non-Islamic government. Okay. So the idea is well, if we take out these few bad guys, then the, the peaceful Muslims will take over. It didn't work. By any stretch of the imagination, it didn't work. I think the United States government meant well, but it didn't work. What happens when you don't face history? And, 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 this, and I can only speak about the United States. I know there's a lot of copy of the United States in the Philippines, but I know it's not absolute. I, I can't speak to the, the way things are here. If I give you the idea, in the United States, there are parts of history we never study in the public schools. You know why? It would mess up our preconceived notions, our modern ideas. So you never study the uh, conquest of Islam of territory because we believe all religions are good and peaceful. You never study what the Roman Catholics did during the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages. Because that would refute our concept that all religions are peaceful. You don't study the things that don't fit what you're trying to convince people. So what happens? You have a population that does not have a clue what's going on in the past. What happens if you don't have a clue what's going on in the past? You don't know how to respond to the government. People in rebellion against Christianity, people in rebellion against the Bible, of course try to rewrite the Bible. But that's not the only thing they have to rewrite. They have to rewrite history. In August, I got to spend two weeks in the Amazon River jungle in Columbia. The story of Sophie Mueller, a lady missionary. She goes there in the 1900s, 1950s, I think. She wanted to be a missionary somewhere where no one had ever heard the gospel. She, she goes into a jungle region where there's no record, no trace of the gospel ever had been. Very primitive jungle conditions. Travel is by canoe, for example. And she goes in there, she goes to this first village, and, and in the way that God had worked, she goes to the first village, and uh, they, they don't understand what she's saying, they decide to kill her. They poison her food. She gets very sick, but she doesn't die. When she doesn't die, they begin to wonder because the tribe had a legend that one day the daughter of God would come to them. So they asked her. Some of them could speak trade Spanish. And that she could speak trade Spanish. They asked her, are you the daughter of God? Well, as a born-again Bible-believing Christian lady, what's the answer? Yes. That's not what they were asking. They meant the daughter of God come down from heaven. But what they asked her was, was she the daughter of God? 
She said yes. So the chief told them to obey her. Anything she said. She starts giving them the gospel. Some of them get saved. She leads some of them into the Lord. And the men form a church. And she tells them it's their job to get the gospel to the next village. Village is there only about a quarter mile apart. It's village, a little bit of village, a little bit of village. So they go to the next village, win some people to the Lord, tell them it's their job to take the gospel to the next village. For 24 years, nobody hears from her. And they, everybody thinks she died. Because normally missionaries go for a four-year term and come out for a year and then back for four. Well, she didn't come out. She's too busy. There was no communication. Folks thought she'd gone in the jungle and died. After 24 years, she reappears. Civilization. And, and tells them the story that there are 400 churches in 400 villages. This, of course, drew attention. Other missionaries went. Before long, there are 800 churches. In so two weeks every three months. They have a two-week class all day long every day. And, and they bring in teachers. Well, in August, my associate pastor, Carl Inkle, and I went, and we were the teachers for the class in August. Never seen anything like it in our life. All of these villages have one church. It's the only religious thing in the village. And they preach the gospel. That's the only church there is. 80% of the people in this region have professed Christ as their Savior. Amen. I mean, it, it's mind-boggling. we have never seen anything like it. But we're in town. That there's a town on the river, and, and that's the way most of it. It's got an airport. You fly there and you go down the river to where Russia goes. Well, they have the class in the town on the river, and I've got a hundred young men being trained to minister. And uh, I'm teaching the Book of Daniel, and Brother Engel's teaching the Book of Nehemiah. And I mean, you've never seen anything like this town where most of the people are saved. It's just not like anything you've ever seen. But there are both American and French anthropologists sent there, paid for by the French government and the American government. Their job is to convince the people to abandon their Christianity and go back to their native culture. I said, it's terrible. The Christians came and stole their native culture from them. And so these folks are talking. I said, would you go tell these people, these Americans, they're crazy? Why would we ever want to live the way that we lived before? I said, they wouldn't want us the way that we lived before. I said, we killed strangers that came. We robbed from them. We fought each other. You, you, it was considered acceptable to kill, rape, steal from anybody of another tribe. So there was only a moral code about how you treated people in your own tribe. You could do anything to people from another tribe. Said so it was violent. The average person died before age 40. There was so much sickness and disease and lack of hygiene. Nobody could read. It was a missionary that turned their language into writing and taught them to read. Said we, we couldn't write, we couldn't read, we killed one another, people were sick all the time. Why would we want to go back? That's a pretty good question. But the anthropologists were there said, Your culture before a Christian, before you were Christians, was your original culture. You should want to live in your original culture. And they're not having any success at all because the people think they're crazy. Why would we want to live like we did before we were Christians? We know what it was like to live like we did before we were Christians. But the anthropologists who are there, they have such a bias against Christianity. And they, they told us, would you talk to them and ask them why they want us to do this crazy thing? Just so happened, as, as we're leaving, we're waiting in line to get on the airplane. Next to one of the anthropologists from the United States. So we asked them, said, why would you want these people to go back to the culture they used to have? And we thought that, and we talked about, you know, women were property, they raided other tribes, they killed people, they didn't have hospitals and medicine, they didn't have doctors, uh, you know. And here was the answer. 
See, before Christianity came, they accepted homosexuality. And now that they're Christians, they don't accept homosexuality. And they said, that's wrong. And they should go back to their culture before they were Christian. Because then they would accept homosexuality. Now, take a guess. Do you think these folks want these people to learn their history? One of the things the men there are concerned about, the young men that are being trained now, never lived under paganism. The young men we were teaching at Bible college have grown up in Christian villages. They have no idea what it was like. The older men remember. The young men have never lived in it. And they're afraid the young men will forget how important Christianity is. So they want them to learn their history. What happened before one woman brought them the gospel? So they're very, they want them to know. Do you think the anthropologists want them to know their history? Not at least. It doesn't fit with their religious ideas. Okay? So they want them to know what happened in the United States today. Multiculturalism has been the, the virtual religious faith of the United States for 50 years. And if you were to teach about the siege of Vienna, or the siege of Malta, or Muslim conquests, it would refute the religious faith that has replaced Christianity. So there's huge parts of history they just simply ignore. Okay. Same thing. You go in, into this area, the Amazon River Basin. Amazon River Basin is huge. There's many areas where there's still no Christianity. But you go into this area, man, you're in town, it's midnight. Elderly ladies and little children feel safe walking around at midnight. There's no crime. No alcohol. There is a place, there's a military base there, and there's a place out in the jungle they call the Sin Corner, where there are places, you know, for alcohol and ungodliness and all that, where the soldiers go, but they don't allow it in town. The majority of the people are saved, they don't want it around. And, and the liberals look at this and say, how terrible this is that people have to live under this. How awful it is. How horrible it is. But the people who remember, they don't ever want to go back to what it was like before Christianity. We're living in a day and age where in my country, in Western Europe, to whatever degree that, that influences the Philippines, we don't remember the wars with Islam. We haven't been taught. Our people don't know. Do you know the first declared war in United States history was against the Barbary pirates, the Muslims of North Africa? And most Americans don't even know that war ever took place. And folks don't know their history. They don't know the theology. They don't know what Islam believes. Many Americans think Islam is just another way of worshiping God. And instead of calling God Jehovah, you call him Allah, it's all the same. It is simply not. Religious ideas and religious beliefs have consequences. What men believe determines what they do. So if a person thinks that he gets killed in, in uh, a bombing, he gets rewarded with paradise and 72 servant women who are all young and beautiful and sensual. That affects what a guy will do. Right? A lot of men will get past that, the fear of dying, because they think that's going to happen. But why as Christians we need to study history? One of our fundamental responsibility as Bible believers is to learn to view history from a Christian worldview. A Christian worldview cannot be maintained if we hide from the facts of what has actually happened. So uh, Jerry Vines in Florida, right after... Uh, the attacks in September of 2001, which focused people's attention in the United States on terrorism. Terrorism was already an issue in the Philippines, it was already an issue in Europe. But, and there have been some terrorist attacks in the United States, but not many, and not involving many people. After September 11th, America was forced to pay attention to this. Jerry Vine said, Muhammad was a demon-possessed pedophile. 
We got all kinds of criticism. But why did he say that? He said, well, it's hate speech. Now, they said, because Muhammad got his revelation from a spirit. So Jerry Vines made the logical assumption, as we did in this class, that spirit was a demon. And he married his last wife when she was nine. Nobody made him marry a nine-year-old. He chose to marry a nine-year-old. And so they answered that. I say, well, that was common in those days. Well, it was common among wicked and godly people. Just like pedophilia is common among wicked and godly people today. What kind of man chooses a nine-year-old bride? And it's not like he was starved for companionship. He had several wives. So if Jerry Vines calling a demon possessed pedophile, there was a reason he said that. The American news media went crazy. Franklin Graham, with whom, whom I have some real different disagreements, but he keeps reminding America, Islam is not a religion of peace. Look at its record. It's not a religion of peace. It gets all kinds of criticism for it. But that's the historical record. It has not been a religion of peace. I pastor a church in Chicago, one of the most liberal cities in the United States. Chicago, the nation is constantly being stressed. America is bad and Islam is good. Your children are having this drummed in their heads repeatedly and consistently. The United States has the military power to crush Islam. You say, well, the United States wants to kill all the Muslims. Really? Can you imagine what a few well-placed atomic bombs would do? If that was really our goal? <coughs> A few well-placed atomic bombs, and there would be no ISIS. A lot of innocent Muslims would die, and so we would never do it, precisely because we're not trying to kill Muslims. Now United States have the military power to crush Islam. It's not been used. The nation is dramatically limiting itself because Americans do not understand the world history. They think handful of radicals Kill a few of the leaders with drones and it goes away. If you kill a few of the leaders with drones, there's still millions of people reading the Quran tomorrow. And so new leaders arise. Right? We've hidden ourselves from the nature, history, and intentions of Islam. Any political leader who recognizes this is silenced by the news media. However, anyone who would like to understand Islam must see them outside the walls of Vienna and outside the walls of the forts in Malta. See them sacrificing their men in great numbers. Again, see to Malta. They have a huge moat built around the main city. And, and so there's this huge ditch between the invading Muslim forces and the walls. They order the Janissaries to go into the ditch and be killed until they filled the ditch up. And, and the other forces can walk in on their bodies. And they do it. Again, hey, paradise. 72 beautiful young women. What's the big deal? Dying only takes a moment. Look what you got after that. And, and sadly, what they had after that is an eternity in hell. But that's not what they think when they dive into those ditches being killed by the defenders on the walls. They think they're moments away from paradise and a harem. That's what they think. It'd be a whole lot easier to volunteer to die, drive in the ditch and die if you thought you were going to wake up in eternal flames. Which is what happened to them. Do not underestimate the recent statements of Mr. Aminadad saying he would not care if they lost half of the Iranian population. There were 70 million people he would be willing at the price of 35 million of his own people to exterminate Israel. The American news media, academia, and politicians have passed these statements off as meaningless rhetoric. Mr. Aminadad, however, would believe he had sent all of those Iranians to paradise consider himself a great hero who would have fulfilled a great purpose. Mr. Aminadad has announced his belief 
that his purpose is to be the one who aligns circumstances to the one that is to rule over all the earth. And he's not in power there anymore, thank God. That doesn't mean he couldn't come back. But he, if he had nuclear weapons, even knowing that Israel has nuclear weapons and would respond, he would use them against Israel. And if it cost him half the Iranian people, he would have thought that was a great service to Allah. Over and over again, Webb scratched the surface. The, the stories of, of General Gordon in uh, Africa, known as the Christian general, who went to save the Sudan from the Mahdi, the fellow who claimed he was the chosen leader to rule over the world, and he was building that movement, and he attacks cities in the Sudan, and they said what they call Chi Chinese Gordon, because he'd been successful in defending cities in China to defend it, and the body overruns him and kills all of them. The, the stories are there over and over and over again. They had sent out a number of civilians allowing them to evacuate the city. And the body sent a message asking Gordon to meet with him under flight of church. He says, if you'll come meet with me, I have something I want to show you, and I will allow you to return in safety to the food. So he comes out, and he shows him the heads of all the people they had beheaded. Him. The civilians trying to evacuate. He said, this is what we're going to do to all of you. You can go back now. This is what Islam has always been. But our movements wanting to reform Islam, God bless them, may they have all kinds of success. But to pretend that they represent Islam today is not realistic. May they grow. The world will be a, peaceful, a more peaceful place if they do. It would be easier to do evangelism if that movement grew. But there are tens of millions of Muslims who got up this morning believing it is their sacred duty to kill you. To pretend they're not there is not the solution to anything. Okay? Let's take a 10 minute break and we will come back and, and go as long as you need to on questions. Okay? Because they had one person in charge. And it is uh, one recognized leader who was in charge of it in the beginning. And, and uh, that just established the text of the Quran and people don't debate. We don't have anybody in charge to say for everybody this is the right text. They, they don't employ that terminology because the Janissaries were uniquely boy, men that had been kidnapped as boys from Christian homes. And so they don't have anything officially like that. But ISIS has been kidnapping a lot of boys from various homes. And that's the thought is they're, they're trying to prepare something like that. But the Janissaries do not technically exist to that. No, not, not uh, the kind of Islam taught in the Quran is not. And that is why you find many Islamic leaders talk about how terrible democracy is. As the honor, you ought to be able to control of the religious leaders. But why do the Western countries serve the economy? Why do they? What do they tolerate Muslims in their countries? Again, I don't have a problem with anybody that lives peacefully, no matter how bad their theology is. But for 50 years in Western Europe and the United States, we have drummed this into everybody's head that all religions are the same. They just have different names for God. Every religion is peaceful. Every religion is moral. All religions are the same. It's not true. But because the majority of people believe this, so it doesn't matter whether you're a Muslim or, or whatever. And, and um, I, I counseled some time back, and the way you came to see me, and 
She had, oh, she visited our church a few times. Her husband had died. And uh, she's a young lady. Her uh, a Muslim young man started to pay attention to her. And as the Muslim young man paid attention to her, she sort of dropped out of church. But after a while, she began to get the idea, this guy's really different than us. Well, you and I would have known that at the introduction. But she was shocked to find out things that he believed. Because she had spent her lifetime in public schools being told everybody is the same. And, and that's President Bush, who inaugurated the War on Terror, said repeatedly, Muslim is one of the world's great peaceful religions, and the Muslim people desire the same thing we do. Okay. If that was true, what well, would be the problem with them coming? But if that is the religion of Western Europe and the religion of the United States, that all religions are the same. And, and that's not even slightly true. Buddhism and Hinduism may be equally false, but they're not at all the same. There's dramatic differences. Okay? There are differences between Catholicism and Baptists, even though we're all called Christian. The idea that religions are all the same is just a fantasy. Uh, Well, I, I don't think these be used to exterminate Islam, but I do think uh, military power, for example, you have to, sooner or later you have to go in Iraq and take out all the ISIS bases. You can't do that with air power, you can't do the negotiation. You do that with a Marine division, okay? Marine tank division. But we don't want casualties. We don't want to get mired down like we were in Vietnam, like we were in Iraq. And, and not an understanding you do. You can go in and take out the ISIS bases and leave. You don't have to rebuild Iraq. There are three groups in Iraq. They're in civil war with each other. Trying to make one nation out of them has never worked. And it did not work when we tried it. And Americans are afraid that if you go back in, you have to do all that over again. I don't believe that. Go in, take out the ISIS bases, see to it they don't have a single base in Iraq and Syria, and then leave and let the people of Iraq and Syria sort out their own problems. And if ISIS reemerges, then you do it again. But the American people don't want um, a repeat of the Iraq war, the aftermath of it. And I was in Alaska, and I was talking to a colonel in one of the Marine divisions that had taken Baghdad. He said, look, an American Marine division with air support can take any position in the world. He said, but we don't know what to do with it after we got it. And that, is the, that was the problem. And it's still the problem. We're not conquerors. We don't know how to occupy a country. Okay? And uh, that's one reason. A second reason, a lot of folks say, why should we be fighting the Muslims? They're just like us. These are just a handful of gangsters. And, and that's not the truth. But uh, America is reluctant, extremely reluctant, and um, that just allows ISIS to grow stronger and stronger. One day we will do it. One day there won't be any choice. But God only knows what happens between now and that day. One day American military might will take them out. They keep daring us to come. They say, we want to fight your Marines in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Trust me when I tell you they don't. They have no idea. They have no idea. The problem is America's political leaders, not their military people. They will take them to pieces. And someday they'll have to. It's not you, sir. It's not your view. It's not the popular view. Among Baptists, uh, preachers. Uh, among Baptists, I think it is. I think, I think every day more American people are coming to this view. I, I would say it wasn't very popular a year ago, but watching all the ISIS barbarity, more and more American people are coming to that. Um, based on your knowledge, do you have an idea that America and the Philippines and other Christian countries would be in great danger in the hands of the Muslims? That's a good question. We're already in danger in terms of terrible terrorist attacks. We've seen them in both countries. The, the question comes, when does it reach a point that they're in danger of taking over the way they have huge sections of Syria and Iraq. 
We're obviously not there yet. I would like to believe they can't get close without the American people waking up, the American military doing something about it. I, I think you have a similar thing in the Philippines to the degree that I know. Your leaders have been hesitant to do everything that's necessary because they don't want to create civilian casualties. Unfortunately, there's no pretty way to fight a war. And, and uh, there's no way to win a war without innocents being killed in the process. But at some point, I have to believe the Filipino government wakes up, at some point the American government wakes up. We're not there where they're about to take over yet. But that will happen. It will get closer and closer and closer until at some point the folks are forced to do something. And my own belief that if there's, in the United States, two or three more terrorist attacks, and the American people will be demanding action. I don't think it's going to take a long time. But that would be a big attack, sir. Yes. I mean, ser seriously, what you need to do is take an American military division, put it in Iraq, and send it to the West. And take an American military division and put it in Jordan. And Jordan's already said they would welcome it. And send it to the East. And you crush everything between you until you meet. And uh, that's, that's extremely doable. I was in Syria and was talking with a young lady who just got saved. She's 20. 22 maybe. All of her male relatives, her husband, her brothers, her father, her father-in-law, her cousins, her uncles, had all decided during the war of Iraq, in Iraq, to go attack the Americans in the name of Allah. So they got together, they had hunting rifles, shotguns, whatever. They went into Iraq and attack a marine base. They got wiped out. Just mowed down. They had no idea what they were dealing with. Shotgun is a good range at three, four hundred yards. Marines have rifles that will fire two miles away. And they were mowing them down before they got close enough to fire their weapons. They just have no idea what the American military can really do. And at some point, the American military will have to do that. And I, I really do believe the American people will demand that this goes on much longer. The what? Yeah, yeah. When the, the news does not tell us what's going on, and that of course should not be. Government should not control the news. Political correctness should not control the news. And um, I believe the more the people know, the better. Because uh, the, the fence, sir, is that when they see violence in the media, uh, some Muslims would say, we are in the news peace. I know. The news would say, we need for the I know. And the media gives them that without answering. I do know that. It's unbelievable. I'm ridiculous. Well, again, there are some people who think, and I think we talked about this yesterday, there's some people who think Islam would be the great one world religion, Mr. Babylon. I believe Islam is a child of Mr. Babylon, as Catholicism is. So I, I'm not expecting Islam to conquer the world and, and, and usher in the Antichrist. I do think Islam can do a lot of damage between now and the tradition. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah, Aminadad was the uh, dictator of Iran for a while, he had stepped down, but uh, I, I, technically he was the president, he got elected, but in a rigged election, I mean, it wasn't like being elected in the Philippines in that state, and um, he was a, a spokesman for radical Islam dramatically. The current leader doesn't go to the UN and say the same things that Aminadad did, but the policy has. But for a while, the Muslim Brotherhood had Egypt, and they they got elected. Okay? But then they began to impose a radical Islamic regime, and the people rose up against them. They did not know what they were voting in when they voted them in. When they realized it, they turned on them. 
So it, it's not everybody in the Islamic world that wants all this. It is there in a big fashion and it will have to be defeated. Ignoring it will not make it go away. Killing a few leaders will not make it go away. So they do research one day. Yeah. Yes. He's called the Mahdi, M-A-H-D-I. Several men have claimed to be the Mahdi over the centuries, but none of them have ever come. And, and so some folks think, well, that's the Antichrist would be the Mahdi to the Muslims and the Pope to the Catholics and etc. and everything to everybody. I wouldn't be surprised at that. Uh, I think it's from yesterday that was talking about the Mahdi. And what did Allah and Muhammad exist? Well, Muhammad lived in the 7th century, 600s. We talked about this at the very beginning of class yesterday, why there's such confusion. The name Allah is the name for Creator God. It is the Arabic word for Elohim. And Muhammad took the name for the Creator God, but then applied it to Ninus, the moon god. So, Arab Christians still use the name Allah. To them, that is the name for the Creator God. But they don't think the Allah of the Quran is the Creator God. They think the Allah of the Quran is the Moon God. Because the way he's described, it's like the description of Minas, the Moon God, that was worshipped in the Arabian Peninsula. This keeps everybody confused. Okay? Christians who support Bible translation, some of them recoil in horror when they find out the Arabic Bible has Allah for God. And they say, well, Allah is not the creator God of creation. He's the moon God. Well, it is when Muslims talk about it. Muslims use that name for the moon God. But Arab Christians use that name for the creator God. So it, it's, it just creates tremendous confusion. So I prefer to say it this way. The Allah of Muhammad is the moon God. Okay? But there are sincere, wonderful, Bible-believing Arab Christians that use the name Allah too. They mean something completely different than Muhammad does. Again, it's like the Jehovah's Witnesses. Is there anything wrong with witnessing for Jehovah? Of course not. Is that what they're really doing? Their Jehovah is not the God of the Bible. They took the name but they don't mean the same thing. Now I know that sounds confusing, but the truth is confusing in this case. Uh, this is an interesting question uh, regarding Bible Baba. Is he part of the Illuminati? Well, I don't have the latest membership in the Illuminati movie. He believes. When people use the term Illuminati, they, they mean different things. Uh, there was a group called the Illuminati in the 1700s, a very specific group. Those guys are all dead. Now, Barack Obama is one of those people who believes the world should be organized against the period of God. Now, what you mean by Illuminati, whoever asked that question, I don't know. But he is in opposition to the God of Bible. And he is one of those who speaks for opposition to the God of the Bible. But whether he's a member of a group that sits around the table and makes plans, I do not know the answer to that. Sir, it's still this popular uh, belief that uh, Muslims love to kill Christians? Well, I don't think the majority of Americans understand that yet, but, but they're starting to. Yeah. Uh, you're still, uh, uh, still yeah, I, I know. So whatever you do in the U.S. I know, I know, I know. Um, the right now, the majority of Americans still believe Islam is a great religion, please. But, but the understanding that it's not is growing with every terrorist attack. And what ISIS has done that they did not intend to do, they've helped a lot of Americans understand what militant Islam really is. The videos of people getting their heads cut off, children getting their heads cut off, uh, people being crucified, the women being taken into sex slaves. 
the American people look at that and say, we're not talking about 20 or 30 guys over here. We're talking about a couple hundred thousand. And they're doing it in the name of Islam. They don't have to see you kill you. They have no idea what would actually happen. They keep saying, we want the Marines to come, we want the Marines to They have no idea what they're asking for. Is that, is that happening right now? No, it's not happening right now. But I'm saying, if you wanted, the reason ISIS is so popular is because we don't need battles. There is a way to change that in a hurry. Okay? Put them up against an American Marine tank division and see how many battles they win. I said, talking to a colonel, military base, he said, one American Marine tank division and air support can conquer any location in the world, anything. He said, we just don't know what to do with it after we talk to this. I mean, that's true. They can't stand up for three even moments. And so they're popular because they win battles. Let them have a few defeats and see how popular they are. And the Kurds are fighting them to a standstill in their parts of Iraq already. And uh, give the Kurds. You don't even have to send the soldiers. Give the Kurds some American tanks. See what happens. Do you think that's a big picture? Yeah. I mean, most of it is Yes. Yes. Because what happens, they want to destroy the Kurds as bad as they do us. And the Kurds are a group, they have their own version of Islam. They have not been as anti-Christian and anti-Jewish as other groups. I know people who are Kurds. And um, they know that ISIS wants to kill them. So they see a simple solution. We kill them first. I'm for giving them all the military equipment they can use. Uh, sir, uh, last question. In general, sir, how do you think we should deal with uh, Muslims? Again, I said yesterday, deal with them as, when you can talk to them as individuals, deal with them the same way you would anybody else. Witness to them, give them the gospel, tell them Jesus loved them, Jesus died on the cross for them. Yeah. Yesterday, I got an email just letting me know they were praying for me from one of the young ladies that got uh, saved out of Islam and is in our church. And uh, she actually moved a beautiful young lady, moved into an apartment building that is managed by one of the, was managed by one of the single men in our church. And, and for some reason he showed a great interest in her evangelism and witnessed her witness to the letter to Christ. And a wonderful email, and they're going, you know, they were praying for me, and they missed me, and, and all that. And, uh, I'm thinking, you know, this young lady was a Muslim two years ago. Her name is Medina, after the Muslim capital, named after the Muslim capital. She was a Muslim two years ago. She's a vibrant Christian that loves the Lord, and is faithful to everything in church today. The gospel does the same thing to everybody. Love them, witness them, to be their friends, be an encouragement. Uh, I, I go to a Muslim barber shop. Every time I go, I take scripture portions and tracts and leave them on there, you know, table of magazines. I leave tracts and scripture portions there every time I go get my hair done. And I'm welcome to do so. Now, we were in there one day, and somebody was getting in there, several barbers. And somebody was in there getting their hair cut that was pro-ISIS. And uh, my barber, who, who's in charge of the barbershop, threw them out in the middle of a haircut. Because he hates ISIS. They don't have a hair halfway cut and he made them leave. And I listened to him argue and, and listened to all the barbers that were telling how terrible ISIS is. And awful. They don't want anything to do with it. And so they wouldn't let the guy get his hair cut. I enjoyed listening to that. But I talk to Muslims the same way I do anybody else. They, they don't understand it. They call me Father. You know, the, that's what they call the Catholic priests and they don't make a difference. It's always, Hi, Father. How are you, Father? Uh, what kind of haircut you want today, Father? By the way, a lot of our saved Catholics call me Father for a while. They don't know any difference. When a lady from Hungary gets saved in our church, and she brought her next-door neighbor the next Sunday. She was introducing a next-door neighbor to me, and she said, the father gives the best mass in Chicago. <laughs> I took it as the compliment she intended for it to be. But 
after a while they get the idea and they stop saying that. But my Muslim friends all call me father. And uh, I witness to them the same way I do anybody else. I don't talk to them about Muhammad. See, I do believe Muhammad is a demon-possessed pedophile, but I have no need to tell Muslims I'm witnessing to that. I tell Muslims I'm witnessing to that Jesus died on the cross for them. We can talk about Muhammad sometime after we've been saved for a while. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. God bless you all.